Hey everybody and welcome to our Embroidery Legacy Live. I'm glad you guys uh, could join us. Let us know where you are checking in from. I see Jan from California, Barb from Pennsylvania. I see uh, Peggy from Missouri and I should put on my glasses right about now. Uh, actually, we have tons of people from all over the place. So this is awesome. We so appreciate you guys uh, taking your your precious time and spending it with us. I know there's lots of things you could be doing right now. Uh, this is our third in the row digitized live, right, James? Yep, it is. Awesome. So James Deere is in the house as well. And we're going to try to do the same type of thing where I'm going to uh, show on screen what I'm doing. I'll talk through it. It isn't really a, I guess, lesson, so to speak, but I did do a little bit of, I guess, tweaking, and I think I can get it so that you can see what I'm doing a little better than the last two. So third time's a charm. Um, I also set up a camera behind me. We had a bunch of questions about how I was set up with my monitor and my pen and my mouse. And I, I have to be honest, I had a, an incredible email come in uh, last week after we did our live. And it was from a gentleman who uh, said that they had been using, I guess, digitizing. And I, I'm pretty sure a professional digitizer has been at it for 15 years. And he had uh, tried to use the pen before with limited success. And it was my little tip of floating with the pen and clicking with the mouse. And he said that he gave it a shot and it clicked for him. And if I can help somebody who's been doing this for 15 years make a little bit of a difference, then mission accomplished. So that was awesome. Uh, we also, I guess, have a, a little bit of an open forum. James is going to be monitoring the comments. So if you do have any questions as I'm going along, feel free to you know pop in and ask those questions. And uh, I think that's about it. I guess I should get started, right, James? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we look forward to uh, hearing your questions in the comments. Awesome. Awesome. And this will probably be the last live we do for a little bit, three in a row. So if you guys have enjoyed these, let us know, give us some hearts, you know, let some comments come through. We, we do like to know if this is a worthwhile thing and we might do maybe one a month from this point. Uh, but uh, Digitize Live is kind of fun and we will do some more artistic designs later on. We're going to focus on an Easter design for this one and I'm going to bring it up. So there is my actual design that we're going to be doing. I have already resized it for the size that I want. I did go in yesterday and digitize this really quickly because I always like to show a sample at the end. The proof is always in the stitching and I'll give you guys my little game plan on how I did this one uh, so that you have, uh, I guess, uh, a little bit of an understanding of what I do when I prep my artwork. Uh, I wish that I would get artwork that was produced specifically for digitizing, but it never, ever happens. I get artwork from anything from something nice and clean like this to a, you know, uh, uh, I guess a pen sketch done on a napkin. It really doesn't matter. But what I do is I will bring it in and I will start to uh, modify the artwork so that it works with embroidery because we have, I guess, rules for stitch types that don't apply to the graphics industry. And the first thing I like to do is I like to give myself a little bit of a game plan. So if I were to look at the colors in this design, and I'm going to do this as an applique. So there's going to be one large applique, which is going to be the, the white in the bunny itself. But if I look at this dimensionally, there is some elements that are in the background. So I'm actually going to do the green first, just the leaves, and outline those parts of the leaves in black. Then I'm going to do my placement. I'm going to do my placement stitch to put my show where to put my applique down. I'm going to do my tack down stitch. I'm going to do the applique itself to hold it in place. And then I'm going to proceed to do the pink color. And I had to write this down. The red color was next, then the yellow, then the blue, and then the black. So there is going to be 10 different color, I guess, uh, you know, stops within the design. In all reality, embroidery files don't really see colors. Uh, machine file formats do have colors assigned, but if you have a DST or EXP file, the colors come up with whatever the defaults are. So I'm looking at stop functions within a design so the machine knows to stop and switch over to the next color. Now, I'm just going to uh, switch over here. And if I do this properly, I should be able to, uh, let me see, I'm gonna go here for one second and I'm gonna go over to my Hatch software. 
So hopefully you're seeing me on screen. I can't really see myself now because I am on screen, but I am going to switch over to my mode here where you're seeing what I'm dealing with. I do have a 32 inch Wacom Cintiq monitor. It is hardcore. It's, you know, as a professional digitizer, this is what I use. Comes with the pen. It actually comes with a little remote here that I have all of my hotkeys programmed in, but I don't use that unless I'm doing editing. I like to have my gaming mouse beside me, right, left. I have all the buttons on the side assigned for left and right clicks, enters, and space bars. So this is really how I'm digitizing as I'm going through a design. And I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a shot of how that looks as I'm doing this. And now I'm going to actually come back here real quick and I'm just going to minimize this screen a little bit and it gives me tunnel vision now within there. But that way you're seeing mainly the actual, uh, I guess, patch software on screen and I'll go back and I'll start digitizing. Now, if I look at this, I am going to use fill stitches inside of the leaves and then I'm going to outline them. I am going to go to my six to one scale. That is the scale that I teach people to digitize at within whatever platform of software you have because it, it's consistent and it allows me to be quick. A lot of people have, I guess, mentioned or commented that I'm pretty fast at what I'm doing. And to be honest, part of the speed that I'm able to digitize at is because of the scale that I'm zoomed in at. I don't have to be 100% on the money. Now, I am going to change that to a green color just so it looks a little nicer. And we'll continue on in green now at this point. Now I'm going to go to a running stitch because I need to travel to my next object. I am going to try to leave the true view on as I'm digitizing so that you can see what I'm doing. Because last time I kind of noticed that when I'm not in true view, it really doesn't show up as clearly on the screen as you're watching. So just a heads up, normally I do not digitize in TrueView, but I'm doing it here because I want you guys to be able to see what I'm doing on screen. So there is my point. Now I can switch back to my other object. I'm just going to do point counterpoint. Some people have asked me, why do I do this point counterpoint as opposed to going in and doing closed shapes? I just find this a little bit faster, to be honest. I mean, I I kind of get used to the tools that I've been using for a long, long time. I'm traveling underneath of the black stitches here, and now I'm going to go straight up into this area because I need a traveling stitch. And then I'm going to go back to my leaf, and I'm going to do my point counterpoint, but the oops, and I'm on the wrong stitch there, so make sure that I am on a tatami. We are not going to count how many mistakes I make today, okay, James? <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> well, actually, it might be fun if we do, true? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my point here. Now keep in mind that is going to be a applique. So I know that I'm going to need a wider stitch than what I see there for an applique, but I need to also take into account that the artwork wasn't necessarily designed for an applique. I doubt very much that the person who created this artwork might have even known the steps or the rules uh, or even what an applique was at all. So now I'm going to travel again to this part over here and I'm going to go back to my fill stitch, point counterpoint. And James, you let me know if there's any questions because I can, for the most part, talk and digitize at the same time. Sounds good. You heard him you heard him there first everybody if you got any questions please leave them in the comments for us okay okay there is my first color done now what i'm going to do just so that you are going to see it is i'm going to hide that color so it's no longer there but it really is and i'm going to go to a purple color even though this is black i know you won't be able to see the black on the screen so i'm going to use purple instead i'm going to go back to digitize but this time it's going to be a satin and i'm going to start back on the other side now why am i starting on the other side because this was actually done first, and I want to make sure that what I did first, I'm outlining first. I could actually go and you know do this part afterwards, um, meaning that I came back here as the last step. But if I do that, then there could be more movement on the machine. I'm always thinking about the runnability of a design as I'm digitizing to make sure that I'm going to have quality results. So there is my first object, this one here. I know that it's going to 
the software automatically, if the objects connect, it will adjust my travel stitches. So I'm not going to get too crazy about traveling if I know objects connect, unless I know that they are not connecting, uh, you know, between points. Then I do have to travel. Now, this one's a little bit of a funny stitch. So I'm going to just do a wider stitch right here to fill in that blank. And now I can go back to a run stitch and I'm going to travel over to this side here. And now I can go back to a satin stitch, point counterpoint. And let's just do this part right here. And then I can come back here and let's go back to a run, travel, and then back to a point counterpoint again. So cool. I'm just going to come right over here and let's do these points. If I ever do make a mistake, I can hit the backspace button. And there is that one and back to a run. And I better speed up here because we don't want to be here all night long. We have a few questions for you. Okay, go for it. Uh, what did you mention you were using for the tip of your pen? Is it made out of metal or how, how uh, is it made of? The tip of the pen, it's actually, it's a PC pen tablet monitor. It's not really a tablet, it's a monitor. And James will put up a link because we do have an Amazon, I guess, affiliate uh, link now, don't we, James? Yeah, we do. We've got a list of recommended Oops. products you can check out on There's Amazon. There's mistake number one. Maybe I can't talk and digitize at the same time, but we'll... Yeah, so there is uh, some affordable tablets, pen tablets, or not pen tablets, but monitors that I do like and I use. And it, it is a company called Ueon, and they have anything from a uh, 16 to a, I think, what's the largest size, like 24 inch or something like that? Yeah, they, they get pretty big. Yeah, they get pretty big. And they're not, I guess, unreasonably priced. That's really the key they are cost effective as far as the price is concerned. Cool. So you can check those out and the pen comes with the monitor. So you don't buy the pen all by itself. It is a monitor that actually has PC pen tablet technology built in. Cool. Um, where did you get the list of the hotkeys? Uh, the list of the hotkeys is in your hatch manual. So you can go on there on your hatch manual and you can actually print off the entire list. Uh, we did have it actually on our one of our courses, I forget which one, but we had a John's favorite hotkeys. I don't know if that's still somewhere, James. I believe it's actually part of our hatch challenge. So if okay. anybody wants to give our uh, free hatch challenge a try, I do believe the list of hotkeys is included. Okay, and that is a printable list. There is a ton of hotkeys. Those ones that we actually have printed off are my personal favorites. So those are the hotkeys that I use pretty much every day as I'm digitizing. I am a big fan of digitizing using hotkeys. They make cool. you faster and you're spending less time on your keyboard. Like right now, if you've been watching me, I am spending most of my time hovering over top of the monitor with my pen and clicking with my mouse with the other hand. So there is my second color. If I come to full screen and I bring this one back real quick, so unhide all, now you can see those two colors together and I can turn this one actually black. So actually that is not a dark black, but there's a black right there. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do the borders around for the applique. And I'm going to come in and actually do the uh, placement and the tack down afterwards. Real quick, I'm going to come back over here though, because I'm going to switch this view and tell me if this works, James. Okay, yeah, I think I'm switched back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my six to one scale and I'm going to go right over here and I'm going to do a digitize uh, open shape and I am use a satin stitch and I'm going to make it three millimeters as far as the satin is concerned. So I'm going to come right here and let's do a three millimeter stitch and I'm going to come right here and I'm going to digitize a little bit off. Now keep in mind, I am really used to a six to one scale been doing this for like 37 years at this scale. So I am in setting from my border knowing that I am going to be okay with this point. So there is my point that I just created and that is thick enough for an applique. So now I'm going to go back to my running stitch and I'm going to come over here and travel to the other ear so that I'm going to the other side and I'm going to go back to that run at three millimeters and I'm going to do the other ear around the other side. And I will do my, uh, my placement and tack down at the end of the design 
because it's going to be easiest for me to see all the creative objects. That's one thing I do love about uh, digitizing software is if you understand the tools in your software, how to what, how and why to use them, then you know that you can resequence objects after you're done. So now I just have to come down here to this bottom part right here. And then I'm going to do this piece and same thing, going to make sure that I have this part here done. We have a few more questions whenever yep. you're ready for them. Go for it. Um, what is point counterpoint? Point counterpoint is uh, kind of like I always explain it when we do our digitizing courses, kind of like climbing a ladder. You are doing a point counterpoint uh, stitch. So I uh, give you an idea. And I'm going to kind of go right over here real quick. If you can see me in the little screen, it's 1.2 points, 3 points, 4 points, 5 points, 6 points. So it's like you're climbing a ladder as you're moving forward. And every line of that ladder is a block that you're digitizing. So that is the digitized blocks, which is a point counterpoint movement. And the good news about it is it's always, always repetitive. Now, that one I'm going to leave as purple for right now. And now I'm going to go to my next color, which is going to be pink. And with the pink, hopefully that answered that question, I'm going to do some pink fills. And I'm just going to choose a fill stitch. I'm going to change my fills and my angles afterwards. So I'm not going to go into too much detail right now as to why I am overstitching these objects the way I am. But it will make sense later on, I, I promise you. And I'm going to turn that into a pink color, so it's pink. And then I'm going to come over and do this other fill over here on this side. So let's go back over to, and let's make sure I'm on pink now. I'm going to do my digitized closed shape and I'm going to do this one as well, over stitching a little bit from the outside right there like that. And I'm going to come right to here and there's my second one. And oops, it is a different color. So I'm going to change the stitch directions of that a little bit later on. Uh, but right now, I'm going to come in and do all of these flowers at the same time. So back to my digitized blocks. We have a few and, more questions whenever you're ready. Yep, go for it. Do you prefer using the digitized blocks instead of digitized open shapes for creating satin lines? Uh, a lot of times, yes, because I have more control. It really depends on the shape. If it is just a standard shape, then it really doesn't matter, meaning that it's a single width. But when you start having objects like this that go from narrow to thick and they're always changing, then digitizing blocks does make a lot more sense. Cool. And why do you use digitized open blocks around leaves of the satin stitch for the outline of the applique? Uh, did, uh, the, well, the leaves I did not, I use digitized blocks just because I'm faster. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I just am really fast and I can control my uh, open ends. So my starts and stop points and my open ends, I've just been digitized. This uh, digitizing point counterpoint or open block, every software has a tendency to call it something different. This was one of the first foundational tools that I used in, you know, uh, digitizing programs like, uh, and not even a program, my first automated digitizing, I guess, board was a Melco Digitrack. And it actually was a board based system that allowed me to do what was called inputs. So mark ones and twos to create objects. And that's really where the whole theory of point counterpoint started way back when. Now I'm going to do the red. And uh, it actually is something that has crossed over to modern software today, which in my opinion, I mean, a lot of people uh, downplay the, I guess, history of where this industry began. But most of the foundational tools that I used 35 years ago are still practically in existence and being used today. So I don't know how you can discredit, you know, I guess theory-based tools that were, you know, been around forever. Cool. And I actually just posted a link to our story if you are interested in learning more about the history of uh, the Deer's Embroidery Legacy. Okay, and I'm just going to do these. I'm trying, I have to switch a little bit between TrueView and not TrueView because when I put TrueView on, I lose my artwork. <laughs> in the background. So it's harder for me to see. So I do need, unfortunately, to, uh, you know, go back between stitches and true view. I know on your screen, you're not seeing exactly as much. I'll switch back as soon as I can. And now I'm just doing this flower here. Is a uh, three millimeters a standard applique width? No, it's a, that's actually a little small. That's about the minimum that I would ever go, to be honest, would be three millimeters. 
the wider the applique stitch, four to five millimeters is usually a little bit safer as far as that's concerned. So, you know, I kind of push the envelope on this one. Three millimeters is safe. Keep in mind that you can create, I guess, uh, SVG files so that you can pre-cut your shapes. Uh, cutting on the machine is always more difficult. Oops, there's a mistake, James. Mark that one up. I've got it. Okay. How many am I at now? I, I counted two so far. Uh, I'll give you two. We'll, okay. We'll just call it two. So there, there is those flowers done, and I'm just going to go back to my view so I can see. Okay, so now I ended here. I'm going to do my next color. Actually, I can't do my next color now. I have some red in here, actually, or dark pink in the nose. I can't forget the bunny's nose, so I'm going to go right down here. Let's go back to here, and I'm going to pan down. That's why I do toggle between my designs as well, meaning that I, I toggle uh, into a one-to-one -one scale, and then I toggle back to my six-to-one scale so that I can get a better look at my artwork and see if I've missed anything. I'm going to go out of true view for a second because these are going to be pretty easy to do with a satin stitch and i'm just going to do point counterpoint but i'm going to do a curve curve straight straight curve curve straight straight curve curve straight straight over stitching some of those tiny little areas but i am just toggling between my left and right click and creating straight and curved points and this is going to give me that almost scalloped edge right there that you see. And it's going to be pretty easy to do because now when I get to this point, back to straight, straight and enter. And if I look at that now, it has a beautiful scallop all the way around. Now I'm going to go to the other side. I'm going to do that process all over again. I'm just going to go straight, straight, curve, curve, straight, straight, curve, curve, straight, straight, curve, curve, straight, straight, curve, curve. And I can go pretty quickly because I got to be honest, nobody is ever going to see the original artwork. Oops. And there's my third mistake, James. You got that one? I got it. Okay. And maybe you could switch your camera to the uh, one behind you so they can see what you're doing. Sure. And let's just go back over here. So here is curve. Oops. I took a break and I made a mistake. Okay, so I'm just going curve, curve, straight, straight, curve, curve, straight, straight, and then straight, straight, enter. So there is my nice, cool little scallops there. So now those pieces are done, and my next color is yellow. So I'm going to come right back over here. I'm going to go back to digitize blocks. I'm going to choose a yellow color, and I'm just going to do this as one big fill this way. And boom, that one's done. Now I can go back to a run stitch, and I'm just going to go over here and run to the other side. And now I can do point counterpoint again, doing these pieces. And I am going to turn the true view on so you can see what I'm doing. You'll see the stitches be generated. I'm overcompensating the direction of the stitch. I can go in afterwards and change all the properties as far as underlay. The other thing that I like about doing this, you might notice that I am controlling the direction of the stitch. If I were to use the digitized closed shape, then what would be happening is every time I created one of these fills, I would be forced to go in afterwards and actually uh, edit the angles of each and every one of these. So I just find this to be a lot faster and I get what I want right away as opposed to having to go in and fix it after the fact. Any other questions, Mr. Deer? Not yet, but keep them okay. coming, guys. We'd love to answer yep. them. Okay, for you. so there I have the yellow done, and all I need to do is the blue. We are rocking and rolling. This design is going to be done pretty quick. Point counterpoint. Now uh, I know I make this look easy, and uh, you know I, I'm not really slowing down. I guess for the sake of trying to show you it's, it's not really a digitizing lesson but keep in mind i've been doing this job for a long long time it comes with practice 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 once you learn the foundational tools in whatever software you own and creating stitches you know the steps of creating all of these stitches it never ever changes it's just a repetitive you know action of creating the same type of effect over and over and over again but you don't get bored because you see something really cool appear on the screen. Is it possible to change a large satin stitch to a tatami stitch without deleting the stitch and redoing it? Yep, and I will do that right now just so you can see. I, I want that one to be a satin. So I'm going to select that object right here. Boom, it's selected. I can see it's selected. 
and now it is a satin stitch. Turn the true view back on, and now it's a satin. It is splicing down the middle because it's actually over seven millimeters, so it's going to splice down the center of that. I could turn that off and tell it not to auto split, but then you run the risk of if it's too long, you'll see these staggered lines appear, and you will actually uh, create invisible embroidery because your machine will not actually stitch everything out. Now, I have all my colors done except for the finishing black. So I'm going to go into hyperspeed. How, how much time are we at, Mr. Deer? We're at 26 minutes. So okay, good. so I'll be done pretty quick. Good. Another question is, yep. um, does Hatch have a candle wick stitch in the software? Candle, yes, it does. It has a whole bunch of different sizes of candle wick, and you can create your own motifs in Hatch. So you can go in and, uh, you know, create whatever motifs you want. I turned everything off there just so you know, because all I want to see is the black outlines. And I know that I've already done the black outlines around the green, so I do not need to do those. So I'm going to logically look at the stitches that I want to create black outlines on. And I am going to come in here and it really doesn't matter which one I do, to be honest. I'm going to, I guess I'll start at the yellow. So I'm going to go back to my three to one scale or my six to one scale. And I'm going to go right over here and let's start digitizing these satin stitches. I'm going to choose a purple color just so we can see it on screen again. And I'm going to do point counterpoint once again, just like this. Do you always digitize from the edge of a petal towards the center? Uh, edge of a petal towards the center. I'm not sure I'm 100% following along. Do you know what they're talking about, Mr. Deer? Um, I think when you were digitizing. Uh, inside out or yeah. outside in? Yeah. Uh, it doesn't matter which way you start as far as whether it's from the inside of an object out or outside in. Uh, but I have just have found over the years that if I stay repetitive, so usually I always start from the inside out. And that's the way I've trained my brain to do it for so many years that I just always have continued this path and it makes it easier for me to not make as many mistakes. Uh, in my classes, and we will probably have some more classes in the future, we've been having people ask us if we're gonna be going back to doing any live events, all that good stuff. That will be in the cards, I'm sure, in the future because things are starting to open up again. But uh, in my live classes, I always tell people that when I digitize, normally, I always have headphones on. So I will have my ed headphones on and I will be listening to the sounds that the software is making because a left click makes one sound and a right click makes another sound. And by listening to the right and left clicks, I can a lot of times audibly tell if I'm making a mistake before I visually see that I've made the mistake. So it's just, you know, again, using the tools and the software, being repetitive and doing, oops, there's a mistake. Number four, James. I think you're at number six already, but okay. we'll say four. <laughs> um, for newbies, what, sh what direction choices should you make? And I think that's a great uh, tie-in to pathing and mapping, which is a part of our digitizer's uh, free cheat sheet. Yeah, uh, we do actually. And that is, I think, a fantastic resource. I, I think that every embroiderer, whether you want to digitize or not, should take that little 30 minute video, I guess, tutorial that I've done. It's called the digitizers cheat sheet. And we include a PDF and it gives you all the rules of stitches. And I explain all of the foundational things like pull compensation and all that good stuff. So we, you know, we really do give you, I guess, a foundation of stitches. And then obviously if you want to learn how to digitize, we have a ton of education that will get you past the learning curve. Does it take time and commitment? Definitely anything worthwhile, any hobby, learning a new skill set, learning how to be artistic. You, you know, unless you just have plain raw talent, it's going to take time for you to learn how to do something new. Yeah, and plus the cheat sheet is free, so you're not losing anything. You might yeah. as well. Everybody loves that word, free. <laughs> it's a magical word. So I'm just going to go around here doing this piece. I know I've already done the other ones. And now let's do this little piece. Now this one I'm going to be probably thinking outside of the box a little bit because I'm going to, oops, didn't want to do that. And where did I go? Okay, if you ever lose your path, you can always hit the C key 
and it will bring you back. C is to, it's a hotkey on your keyboard. It will actually bring you back to the center of your last object. I'm going to go right over here. And actually, I don't need to do that. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to go back to digitize satins. I'm going to do this little piece. Okay, now I'm going to go back to a run and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to do this little piece all by itself because it's just straggled over there. And now I can continue on and do this little piece and it will go over itself. So it will overlap instead of underlap. And that's another thing that I always try to do is make sure that my overlaps and underlaps make sense. You can, you know, kind of trick the software with different directions. So you can make sure that your directions change enough as you are moving forward. And let's go here, here, here. There's that point. And now I probably could come over here and let's do, let's see, let's do this point right here. I'm going to leave that little dot completely out of the design. I don't think it really needs to be there, to be honest. And that's the other beautiful thing about artwork is when you are digitizing something manually and you know that nobody's going to see the original artwork that came with the design in the first place, you have the liberty and the freedom to make whatever design choices you want. So I'm just going to come over here. Let's uh, go. Yep. Why block your satin stitch? Wouldn't it be easier to do a run stitch and then convert it to a satin? Uh, no, because your run, depending on your offset, it'll always be towards the center of the object. So you're going to be guessing every single move you make. By digitizing point counterpoint, I am drawing these objects exactly the width I want with the curves and inclinations because you have to remember every time i do a point and a counter counterpoint it uh, is defined the i guess inclination or the curve of the stitches is defined by that bar that i put down the center so this bar that i put here is going to define the direction of the stitch and when you don't use the point counterpoint and you're using a line tool and then just converting it to a satin it will automatically define the shape based on the center out. And you can do an offset on it, but the only problem with the offset is uh, if you don't choose the right direction in which you've pathed, it might you know, be outside of the flower or inside of the flower. So it's all about control. I like being able to control the tools in my software program and I like to be able to know what those tools actually do and how they're going to create the stitches. Absolutely. Uh, design runnability is all about how it was digitized. Any design is only as good as the digitizer who made it. Other question, Mr. Deer? Um, nothing yet, but if everybody's enjoying Oops. this design so far, be sure to give it a, a thumbs up. And who knows, maybe we'll have an early Easter present for everybody. What do you think? Oh, James. Now we have to give something away. We'll see. We'll see. It depends on how everybody <laughs> likes the design. Okay. Well, give us, give us some uh, hearts up, you know, some hearts and thumbs up and all that good stuff. Comment if you would like maybe to have this design for free. We said that magic word, but <laughs> we'll show you what it looks like. And I am almost done guys. So there is that point. Now all I have to do is digitize this little area here and then this little area here. Oops, backspace, didn't like that one. Straight, straight, curve, 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 curve. If you have taken any of my education, you have heard those words over and over about 10,000 times. Straight, straight, curve, curve. It's all about where which button you click on your mouse and I am hovering with my pen and one more little piece and I am done awesome okay now here true view let's go back select everything I'm going to make sure that everything is unhidden I'm going to come back in now and grab just these little pieces here. So I'm going to grab just that piece. I'm going to tell it to hit the H key. I'm going to change the stitch angle so that it is going this direction. 
and I'm going to tell it to be about 0.8 millimeters and travel on edge. And let's turn off the underlay. I could have done these both at the same time, which would have made more sense, but I wanted you to see the difference. So if I look at this now, look at these two right here, I'm going to zoom in. If you look at this one and this one, I actually have, and I'll get rid of the artwork, you can see that I have a travel on edge stitch right here. If I go back to this area, this is what I want, a nice sparse stitch. So if I change this one same way, I'm going to change the stitch direction, make it this direction right here. I'm going to go in and turn off my underlay. I'm going to adjust my uh, spacing to 0.8 millimeters and hit that uh, travel on edge. And now I'm going to have some nice uh, cheeks that are going to be kind of rosy, but showing the fabric underneath show through. And that design is done. The only thing I have to do now is my tack down and my pla uh, placement and tack down stitch. So I'm going to go to my three to one scale because it's going to allow me to see what I'm doing. And I'm going to choose my digitized close shape and I'm going to choose a totally different color. And I'm going to start right here i'm going to come about 30 percent from the outside in and i'm just going to put a stitch right here so this is going to show me where i'm going to place my material for this applique and i'm going to go right here here now this is something that i like to do that's maybe a little bit different than what you've seen before i'm going to extend my applique underneath all of the flowers even though the uh, flowers fall outside of the bunny's head I'm going to make sure that my white material goes all the way around the flowers. The reason why is if you don't do that, you will find that all of a sudden halfway through one of the flowers, it looks like the stitches are dropping off and water falling because you have material on part of the applique and not on the other. So I'm just going to go right over here. Same deal. I'm going to go here. I'm going to put this one down all the way around the outside of just the yellow flower right here and let's do this one and there is that object done oops and there we go that's well, kind one of a more mistake. question for you whenever there we go so there's that now the next one i'm going to do one more stitch and then i'm finished so just let me go on with this for one second james one more stitch and i'm going to do the same thing digitize close shape but this time i'm going on the inside of it so i'm going to go right over here around the inside I'll try to be as fast as I can. That's going to hold the fabric in place after I've laid it down. And that other stitch that I did for the uh, placement stitch, that I could turn into an SVG file so that it will cut on my silhouette or my scan and cut or whatever, Cricut, whatever type of machine you have. Yes, your question, Mr. Deer. Cool. Um, do you usually create your own applique stitches using the satin and run stitches instead of using the digitized applique tool? If so, uh, why? Because I'm so old school and I think I do it better than the software does. I hate to say it, but I just, uh, I have my rules. If you've taken some of our education, actually we have our free education, which is our creative digitizing course that actually comes, it's eight hours of theory that comes as a bonus within our digitizers dream course. A lot of people don't even know that it's there, but I teach people all of the manual principles of creating appliques and all that good stuff. So what I'm going to do is take that last one that's the tack down and I'm going to just repeat it or backtrack and that way it'll go over twice so it'll hold down securely. Now if I look at this, all I have to do is take that one, turn it to black, and then I have to take these two stitches right here. They are the placement and the tack down and I'm going to move them up in the sewing order to the third, I guess, color. So when I look at this now and let's turn this to black as well. So if I look at this, the design is done. If I look at the player, it is going to do the green first. It's going to outline it. It's going to do the outline and the tack down. It's going to put the applique stitches. It's going to do all the fills in there. And it's going to outline everything. And we are done. How many minutes is that, Mr. Deer? It's about 40 minutes. That's okay, awesome. so 40 minutes. We created the design in 40 minutes. Okay, so anyways, uh, other questions? Um, are the outlines or offset work for appliques as well? Or will the outlines and offsets? Uh, outlines and offsets can work, but again, it just depends on the shape and how much you, I guess, inset from it. I, uh, yeah, you, you could definitely use those and they will be a little bit quicker. I just tend to be, here's one of the reasons why. 
because the uh, that I would do that. And actually, I'm going to come straight over here. Let's go back over here so you can see me. And I'm going to make myself a little bigger here so we can see that. Okay. So the reason why I would not use the offsets or insets, which is an automated feature, is because the width of the stitch on the ears and on the face is three millimeters, but the width of the stitch around the uh, flowers is about, uh, you know, maybe 2.2 millimeters, if I were guessing. So they are different widths on the offset. So if you choose a set inset or offset, it's not going to take account that you have two different widths that you're dealing with or that you have some objects that are, you know, uh, flowers and others that are the bunny's head. I hope that all makes sense. Yep. Um, a few people are asking if we could provide the artwork for... Uh, new, I cannot because I I purchase licenses for artwork and I am allowed to use them to digitize and to make designs and resell those designs. But I have do not have the license to give away the artwork to people for free. However, so that, we just might give you guys the the design file. Yes, for you design to study. file. Yes, but the artwork, uh, I, unfortunately, I cannot. And so. How did you move the uh, objects around without dragging them? Uh, I did drag them. Okay. Did yeah, drag. I did. I did grab them in the sequence and I dragged them up. And what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you guys a little video so you can see how this ran on the machine. So let's just go right over here, choose a video and let's do this one. Okay. So this video should be coming up right now. And it is doing that green stitching that I showed you that we did first. So all of the green stitching is going down. That is a fill. You can see that the directions of the fills are changing. And I love the way that light and embroidery interact because it's not just all one 15 degree angle, which if I use that outline tool, then all of the stitch angles would be identical and the same. By changing the stitch directions, light hits thread and it gives it more dimension. Now there is my two stitches, my tack down or my outline. There's my tack down. I took it off the machine. I cut it out. I put it back on and this is the three millimeter stitch around the outside. And then it's going to do all of the fills and pretty much, pretty much the same order as I did. I'm kind of and impressed for the most part. I think you actually forgot to do the uh, black lines in the ears when you digitized oh, yeah, I did. It in the software. Sorry. Okay. Mistake number 12. <laughs> okay. I forgot that. I forgot the outlines in the ears, but the stitch file that I did when you see this. So right now, guess what? Didn't forget then. Did I you? didn't forget then. <laughs> so yeah, we do always, you know, make sure we proof our designs, which when you are learning, especially you definitely should now. Do you see how the, the applique uh, fabric, that white fabric, went all the way under all of the petals that we did. I did not actually cut it short into the ear and leave half the petals without fabric, half with, with fabric, because that's where you end up having the issues. So there is the pieces in the ears, and there it is actually all done. And we have this cute little bunny rabbit. We I just called her Mrs. Bunny. <laughs> that's the name I gave her. So will this design stitch well on terry cloth? Uh, if I were going to do it on terry cloth, I would probably increase the width of the satin stitches a bit, which I could put pull comp on all the flowers and everything. And I might change it to 3.5 millimeters for the, uh, for the actual, you know, uh, stitches around the ears and stuff. It, it should run fine, but I'd probably make it a little bit wider if I'm dealing with terry cloth. Awesome. And let's just go right here. Now, uh, actually, one thing I did want to show you, I don't know if I have time, maybe I'll show you this afterwards. I don't think I have time for this. But I did want to show you guys some really fun, cool stuff that we have that is coming up right now. So I wanted to show you guys what is new at Embroidery Legacy. And we do have some fun prizes to be won as well. So yes. make sure you stick around. And I will also let people know that this design, which is called Mrs. Bunny, uh, James, is this going up in the Facebook group? Is that what we decided? Yeah, it will be. It'll be going up in our Digitizing Made Easy Facebook group in the file section. So be sure to join that group if you haven't yet. Yeah, so in the file section, and I don't think it's there now, or is it? Uh, nope, yeah. not yet. Okay, not yet. So give us until tomorrow around this time, and we will have all the files there uh, yeah, for you. Tomorrow, so tomorrow morning. morning. Tomorrow morning, okay. You heard that. That's actually <laughs> James' uh, job is to do that. So... What time in the morning, James, just so we can put you to the test? <laughs> Let's say it'll be up by 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, you actually have a meeting that I have to take you to at 10 a.m. Oh, 
I don't know. Well, <laughs> okay. Just kidding. It'll be up. Okay. Anyways, I, I'm trying to sabotage this just a little bit, guys, because he he was so you know pointing out all the mistakes that I was making. So, anyways, here's what's new at the Legacy. If you didn't know, our St. Patrick's Day designs are on sale for 51% off right now. So uh, go over. I think James is putting on the link. And if you need a St. Patty's design, we do have a ton of them to choose from. But this was all about. Uh, there we go. Easter. So I wanted to give you guys a little Easter trunk show. I did come up with four different design packs for Easter this year, and I'm just going to show them to you quickly. This is our Easter trucks. And I did a bunch of, uh, hippity Easter spring, happy Easter trucks. So they are pretty cool. They're colorful. They are full embroidered and they do come in multiple sizes. So those are a brand new release and James should be putting up all the links for the Easter sale as well. And we also have the Holy Week. This is a single color design pack, which basically goes through all of the events. Easter actually is, you know, it definitely is about cute little bunnies and chocolate, but it is about obviously uh, Jesus and the Holy Week. So for those of you who do, uh, you know, I guess adhere to that. If you're a Christian, as, as you know, that's your belief, as is mine, then that is what we have for you guys for Easter. We also have the Lilies and Special Sunday, and this is another uh, theme pack specifically for the Easter holiday. And then my favorite, this is the one that we actually had a little bit of fun with. This is our Easter egg ornaments. So this one I have to show you guys real quick because I love these. We actually did them as applique, but it is a double-sided applique. I'm gonna hide this for one second because I want you guys to see these. Here is our Easter egg ornament. It is using mylar, it is using puff stuff. Actually, I'll put it right in my face there. And you can actually do them so they are double-sided. So we have all kinds of really cool Easter eggs. Yes, we have the tutorial with it. It's an in the hoop project. And uh, there's a video as well that should be up. You know when the video is going up, Mr. Deer? It's going up on YouTube tomorrow. Okay, so tomorrow. At what time? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is actually 12 different Easter eggs. And they are pretty cool because they, I don't know, they're just, they're just fun. So that is the Easter egg bundle. And I am going to show you that video right now just so you can see how they were made. That's the really cool part about what I do for a living is I get to play with all of this stuff. Here is our Easter eggs. Okay, so I did use a piece of our uh, prep patch. You could use a water soluble stabilizer as well, so it does not need to be pet patch, uh, pet prep patch, but it does actually work really well given the amount of stitches, so you don't have any tearing. Uh, this actually is just showing the cut file that we did. So this was a separate hooping. I just want to be clear about that because we did cut out, pre-cut the Easter eggs. It's much easier to cut the shapes, give a little bit of spray adhesive and lay them down right on that running stitch outline so you know that they're going to line up 100%. The other thing I love about the prep patch is because it is clear, you can see through it, when you lay down your appliques, you can very easily pick it up and look at the other side to make sure that they're lined up. I don't know if you've ever laid down any appliques and then found that you didn't lay it down in the proper place. It's happened to me a million times. Well, with the prep patch, that happens no more. Uh, mylar, just take a little piece of mylar, put it down over top, I taped it, and then it is going to go back on the machine and it's going to do all of the, I guess, uh, kind of trapunto fills. They are travel on edge fill. If you've taken my mylar classes, you know my magical recipe is 1.2 millimeters. I don't really have any secrets. Stitches are stitches. If you have software and you want to play, and you know, go in and examine, see what I did, then by all means, create it yourself and have fun. It's all about having fun. So these are all the fills. Now, when it does all of those fill stitches, loose fills on the Mylar, then you're going to stop the machine. And then you're gonna take your puff stuff and you're going to put your puff stuff over top and it will then do all of the satin stitches. There are satin stitches on the inside of the eggs 
And then at the very, very end, there's going to be a satin stitch going around each of the eggs. I made sure that when it does that satin, it does a very loose zigzag to hold that puff stuff in place, and then it does the finishing satin stitch. Now this is when it gets fun because you just take it out and you rip off your prep patch. It should come off pretty easily with all of those stitches. Then you're going to take your scissors, be very careful not to cut into the satin stitch. Uh, if you look closely on this video, you'll see that I accidentally did cut into the satin <laughs> stitch on, but I fixed that with my glue gun. So there's always ways to fix things. And keep in mind the puff stuff and mylar are completely optional, but it does give a nice look to the design. Yeah, you don't have to use mylar. You don't have to use puff stuff. You can make flat, unshiny ornaments, but why would you want to do that? You, I mean, you, but you can definitely, you know, use other products in there. I would not use 3D puffy foam because it's not digitized for that. With the puff stuff, you just rinse it away with warm water, not hot water, and then I let them dry. Now, when they dried, they did kind of curl up a little bit. My eggs kind of curled up because they dried and I used a canvas material. So I just took an iron, I used a Teflon cloth, and I actually just heated them up a little bit and they came out nice and flat. Once they were flat, then I took them over to my other station. I put on a little bit of glue for my tab and glue is hot. Uh, I did kind of uh, burn myself a little bit, but <laughs> luckily there was no sound on. Uh, it was right here. I said, ouch. Uh, but anyways, um, you, <laughs> you then take your glue gun after you put your little tab on and you very quickly go around the outside of the egg. I just came almost to the point of where that satin stitch started because when I press it together and because it's not too close, it give me, gives me a nice solid edge and it actually retained the shape perfectly. So they're pretty easy to make. You can knock out a few dozen Easter eggs in a day. They're not that hard to do and they look really, really cool. cool. So we have a few questions. Sure. First thing, what spray adhesive did you use? Uh, I actually use the 505 uh, that I had and I do actually, uh, I know that the Sulky has a, uh, I guess a spray adhesive with a green lid and if I can and if I can find it and I don't do many events anymore where I've been able to get products, but I do love the, uh, the Sulky uh, spray adhesive with that green lid because it is environmentally friendly. So we do try to you know, use products that support the environment. Awesome. Um, tying into that, does the wash away hurt the pipes when you... No, uh, the, uh, the wash away, I would, as far as the wash away stabilizer is concerned, I would make sure that you uh, cut as much of wash away stabilizer as possible. We didn't use wash away stabilizer. We use the prep patch, which actually tears away. But the puff stuff is actually environmentally friendly. That will not harm your pipes in any way, shape, or form. Cool. Um, what sort of stabilizer did you use in the beginning? Uh, I used the uh, prep patch. So it's actually a clear, actually, it, this is what it looks like right here, just so you can see it. And I really, really like it for one main reason. This is the prep patch here. And you can probably see that it has little dimples. The, the one side here is actually kind of rough and dimply, and the other side is smooth. And what I do is when I hoop it, I put the dimply side down, and when it presses into the hoop, that dimply side helps it not to slip out of the hoop. If it were really, I guess, uh, what would the word be, James? Like uh, flat on both sides? then it might actually pop out of the hoop as you're loading all those stitches in. So this is a great product and we do have that on our site. I used our Mylar, which is an iridescent Mylar. It works really well. And then of course the Puff Stuff, which is uh, water soluble, environmentally friendly. And James, will put all those links up if anybody's interested. Can you attach the eggs in the hoop? Uh, no, I would not. not. I would not attach the eggs in the hoop uh, if you are using puff stuff. If you want to get creative, you might be able to edit the files so that you do an egg on either side with all the fills and all the satin stitches and leave that finishing stitch and then maybe try to put them together and do the finishing stitch last in the machine in the hoop 
and you could try that and it would work, but I would make sure that you use a pre-wound bobbin with the same thread as your top thread. Because if you don't, you're going to see as you turn your egg, bobbin stitches on one side and regular stitches on the other. So great idea. That could be done too. Cool. Awesome. Any yeah. other? No, but I think we do have some prizes we're going to have to give away. Okay, we do. And I think the next slide, just so we, okay, well, actually, just so you guys know, we did a huge amount of Easter designs last year, and they're all on sale for 51% off as well. James will put up that link, but who wants to win a prize? Is that <laughs> Let's good? see. Leave, leave, the, leave the comment win, and okay. we'll see. Who so win. win, and what you will win is your choice of either the uh, Easter trucks or the Holy Week, or the lilies and uh, what was that one called? Uh, Easter Sunday, something like that. Anyways, yeah. I forget. I forget what the name was. I could probably back up here. There we go. Sorry, lilies and special Sunday, uh, or you can win the Easter egg ornaments. So you will have your choice of in any of those designs. Awesome. And if you do want to check out, I think we have like over three hundred Easter designs that are on sale right now. Yeah, there are a ton. There's a ton of them. Okay, so who wants to win? Type in win. Uh, if you did enjoy that little exercise of digitizing, let me know. I've done it three, I guess, lives in a week, or sorry, three lives in a row, and I probably won't do one for the next live just because too much of one thing uh, might be too much. <laughs> so give us, uh, you know, thumbs up if you liked it, and we'll schedule another one in the future, but we'll probably switch things up a little bit for the next live. Okay. One more really cool announcement. Are you ready for the wins? Because while you're doing that, almost. I'm going to bring the software. Finish up. Okay. Almost ready. Okay. I'm going to do something else because this is really, really cool. For those of you who love ESA fonts, you know that we have almost 900 and something done at this point. We are the largest developer of ESA fonts in the world, and they load into your Hatch software. Uh, they are object-based. Well, we, starting this week, have 10 new fonts, one being released every sing single week for the next 10 weeks, where we have done our line fonts, which means that they are meant to be used with running stitches. Everybody give me thumbs up because that is something people have been asking for over and over again is running stitch fonts. So I'm going to come in real quick to this one because I'm going to type in Mrs. Bunny here using this week's release. And we do have a video going up on YouTube this week, James. Do you want to fill them in on what that's about? If you can. I'm sorry, just one second. Sorry. Right. Well, I can do that. What we actually have this week coming is our very own Linda Rayburn, who is the magician when it comes to Hatch and ESA fonts and creating all kinds of awesome in-the-hoop projects and Things. We have all kinds of her lessons on our site. Uh, she is uh, doing a whole bunch of different things using these line fonts. And the first video is going up, I think, when? Next week. Next week? It's yeah, not this tomorrow's week? Tomorrow's video is the Easter eggs. Okay. Okay. Well, tomorrow's video is the Easter eggs. So this is going up, I guess, uh, next week. And it is called line. And James was probably frantically trying to get my attention there. <laughs> Were you? Uh, a little bit, but a it's all bit. good. Okay, <laughs> so I'm going to type in Mrs. and we'll do Bunny. So there's Mrs. Bunny. Okay, and I'm just going to move Mrs. Bunny down here, and I'm going to make Mrs. Bunny. I can make it as big or small as I want, so we'll make it 30 millimeters right now, and I'm going to adjust the spacing to, let's say, zero, so it'll be closer together, and then I could hit the H key and adjust all of these points here. So now I have a font, that is a line stitch that is gonna say Mrs. Bunny. And you can have this going along a collar. You could do whatever you want with it. And let's just grab these ones here and let's move them over. And then I'll take Mrs. Bunny and I'll move this down. Now, the cool thing about this is, and this is not gonna be a really long demo, but this is an object right here where if I go and I break it apart, and let's just go in here and break it apart as many times as I can, and it'll take a while to break apart, but it's grayed out now. And now the cool thing is I can have a single run stitch. I can have a triple run. I can have a back stitch. I can have a stem stitch. 
I could actually create this as a motif, which that one does not look very good. But if you want to have some fun with your motifs, go to single motifs. And if you want to do this as a chain stitch now, which let's do this one, I can do an incredible chain stitch and I can have it go over and over again. So anyways, that just gives you a tiny little taste of what Linda is going to show you with our new line uh, fonts. And there is 10 of them coming up. And the first video apparently is coming up next week. <laughs> so you want to make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can see Linda's first video. Could you change the uh, color to a darker one? It's a little sure. bit hard to see. Let's do this or this. There we go. So there's Mrs. Bunny or red. Any color you want, we can change it. And if I want to change it to a stem stitch, I can do that. I can actually have three passes of stitches. I can have it go here to a back stitch and do five passes on a back stitch. I mean, there's just so, so many options of what you're going to be able to do with these line fonts. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And they were a little bit of a uh, puzzle to digitize so they work well, uh, but they are built for the Hatch platform. They, awesome. yeah, just so you guys know, if you're watching and you don't own Hatch, ESA fonts are embroidery specific alphabets that are specific for Hatch. So they, they won't load into any other program, unfortunately. Cool. Awesome. Okay. So are winners, we ready Mr. For Deer. Some winners? Yep. All righty. Let's do it. So our Facebook winner is Susan Kubala Sokol. So congrats, Susan. And awesome. our YouTube winner is Victoria Bailey. Awesome. So congrats, awesome. everybody. Please send us an email at contact at embroiderylegacy.com to claim your prize. Perfect. And if you don't know about our digitizing uh, or our, sorry, our embroidery legacy design club, check that out because all of our designs are way more than 51% off if you are a club member. Uh, Digitizer's Dream Course, if you do want to learn how to digitize and you want somebody to help you get past the learning curve, that's what I'm kind of known for. That's what I've been doing for many, many years. So we have support to help you guys with your software in 10 different programs, not just Hatch, but others as well. If you don't have uh, any software or you'd like to try Hatch, please download the free trial through our website because we will give you all kinds of free education. Uh, we are an official reseller for Hatch. So if you get it through us and take our challenge, we will give you all kinds of education to help you get past the learning curve to see if digitizing is actually something that you do want to do. A lot of people buy software thinking they want to digitize and find out that they really didn't want to digitize and that is called buyer's remorse. So I would much rather rather people give it a try and see if it's something that is meant for you. Awesome. And any other things, Mr. Deer? How, what time are we at for this right now? We're, at, we're an hour and three minutes in. An hour and three minutes. I try, to, I try my very best to keep these to almost exactly an hour. So <laughs> mission accomplished again. Uh, make sure you do uh, subscribe to either our Facebook groups. We do have two of them. One is our Hatch Facts group that is specifically for people who own Hatch. We have a, a great a team of admins and a great team of members uh, of the group who are helping other people get past the learning curve. And we are almost at 9,000 members. Uh, our Embroidery Legacy group, which is, what's that one called, James? Uh, Embroidery Digitizing Made Easy. Okay. And that one, we hit 25K. So we are at 25,000 members That's on awesome. that one. And YouTube, please subscribe uh, and you know hit that bell for notifications because you're going to want to catch Linda's video for sure. Absolutely. And uh, we actually are at forty six thousand four hundred. So we just uh, you know we love what we do. We really thank you guys for joining us and being part of uh, you know part of the legacy. It's been a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. And uh, we're wishing you a very happy Easter. And just a reminder, the free design will be available for y'all tomorrow in our Facebook group. Plus, and, we will be posting the links to everything that John mentioned in the chat. Awesome, awesome. And what time was that design going to be there, Mr. Deer? 10 a.m. sharp, EST. <laughs> okay, so that's awesome. So we have it there. James is going to have that up by 10 a.m. So you're going to want to visit the group to download that file. And I think that's it. Other than that, blessings, guys. Have a uh, wonderful, wonderful evening. And uh, I guess a wonderful Easter as well. Thanks. <laughs>